Thank you, Greg. Thank you for preparing us and leading us as we worship today. I'd like to ask Barry Gridley if he would come at this time and lead us in a prayer, then the Lord's Prayer, and then lead us in the scripture that we're going to study today. Barry? Our prayer for today. Lord, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching him to love all people as neighbors. As his disciples in this age, we offer our prayers on behalf of the world in which we're privileged to live and our neighbors with whom we share it. Open our hearts to your power moving around us, between us, and within us until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by justice and compassion, and in the healing of all that is broken. Amen. Please join me now as we pray in the way that Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The scripture reading for today is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord and concludes today's reading. Thank you, Barry. Our choir is coming at this time and is going to be sharing a song about uh, one of the disciples and his experience uh, of uh, coming to uh, terms with uh, the risen Lord.
Thank you, choir. There were a couple of lines in that song that uh, really stood out to me. The vision of his skeptic mind was keen enough to make him blind <laughs> to any unexpected act too large for his small mind, for his small world effect. Well, Jesus had uh, all sorts of followers, and uh, today, today we're going to be looking at uh, some of the responses of the uh, disciples. I want to tell you, I have uh, been very grateful for your prayers. Uh, Judy has been in the hospital again uh, this time for a couple of weeks. She's coming out uh, tomorrow. And uh, she's going to come home, and we're excited about that. Thank you for your prayers. That's, that's a miracle uh, for Judy and me. Also, last week, we had uh, the Easter service here in the sanctuary. And it was uh, wonderful to, it, it just felt wonderful to be in the fellowship of other uh, believers and seekers and followers of Christ. Um, we uh, met afterwards, uh, a couple days later, the music and worship uh, team, and we evaluated uh, what worked, what didn't work, and what can we do better next time. And so we're in the process of preparing to have uh, services again uh, in the church, and we'll keep you posted on that. Okay, so today, let's take a look at the passage, which I believe we also read last week, but there's just so much in here that that I need to repeat some of it. I need to go back and review some of it. When it was uh, evening on that day, Jesus was resurrected on that day, and uh, so the story picks up what happened the evening of the resurrection. The first day of the week. This is where uh, Sunday became a day of worship. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a dramatic change actually a violation of the Ten Commandments to move from the Sabbath to the first day of the week. But, but the day was so significant that they started meeting and worshiping on the first day of the week. And that's how we um, have now uh, continued that uh, tradition. It says, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked in fear. Boy, if anyone did not believe in the resurrection, it was these disciples. They had no expectation that he was anything but dead. Now, Mary had already visited the tomb and had reported her findings to uh, Peter and John, but how, how do I say this? In those days, the testimony of a woman was not considered reliable. And so they dismissed it. So they continued on now in their, um, in their fear. And they were locked in fear because of the Jews. They figured that if, that if uh, the authorities hunted down Jesus, they would also hunt down these uh, followers of Christ to eliminate and cut, uh, nip in the bud any uh, possibility of a movement here. So Jesus came, and it says, he stood among them. He passed through the walls. One of the other Gospels says that. He passed through the walls. Uh, some people question that. But, but I would say this. If Jesus can be resurrected from the dead, he can pass through walls. Uh, no problem at all. And he says to them, said to them, peace. Now, John wrote his Gospel in Greek, but in all likelihood, he spoke in Aramaic or Hebrew. And assuming it was Hebrew, I hope it was Hebrew, uh, for the purposes of this message, when he said peace, he meant shalom. And he did not mean just uh, external peace from the threats of, of authorities, but he meant peace in terms of inner peace, wholeness, wellness, that that the world, that the world is all right because God is in charge and we're connected with God. 
And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Now, as I was reading the commentaries and preparing for this, I was wondering, um, Jesus was raised from the dead. Why didn't he heal his hands? Uh, we'll have to ask him. He doesn't say. But let me speculate that I believe Jesus is wearing those wounds, even now in heaven, as a trophy. You and I go through experiences at times, and, and they're hardships. They're cruel. There's enormous suffering, maybe even trauma. But after a while, I hope that the Lord leads us on a journey where we can treat those very terrible events that served as scars in our life and in our journey, now treat them as trophies. That God is using those things to uh, help us now to uh, minister to other people. Well, okay, so he went through the walls. He said, peace to you. He says it twice. Shows them the wounds in his hands. And it says, and the disciples, catch this, in, in just two verses, these disciples go from terror to rejoicing. Uh, that's the effect of, of good news. And I trust that periodically you have that kind of experience. We all, we all go through the valley of the shadow of death periodically. And those are terrible things that we do not seek, but sometimes we don't have a choice in the matter. But then we come out the other side and we rejoice that we've seen what God has done. They rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And this second time, he said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Folks, Jesus hardly gave them any time to, uh, to absorb what was going on. Uh, in, inside of a minute, they are terrified, and then they are rejoicing. They are locked in fear, and now they see the risen Lord with evidences that he is risen. You know, you and I grew up with the idea that Jesus was raised from the dead. To us, it's just sort of a settled matter of fact. But, but to these fellas, to these people, this was incomprehensible news. This was mind-blowing. This had to be disorienting to them. And, and within the single conversation, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He, he now gives them a commission. He gives them orders. Not, he gives them orders to unlock the doors and go out. Go out into the marketplace, into their families, into their workplaces, and begin telling other people what, what they have seen. Let me... Let me tell you what it does not say. Jesus did not give them the commission to bring people to church. Now, I don't want to discourage you from bringing people to church or inviting people to watch this service online, but he doesn't. He tells the church to go out into the world. He doesn't tell the world to come to the church. And you and I need to have this perspective that while we do come to church, it is to get recharged, reconnected, have the fellowship of other believers rub off on us. And after being recharged, we are to go out. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now again, um, John wrote this in Greek. We have it in English. 
And when uh, we think of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I um, have to say that I, I, think, um, I think some of us think of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Remember him? Watching, I enjoyed watching him as cartoons uh, as a kid. I saw this, uh, I saw this uh, cartoon or comic book in a thrift store, and so I bought it, hoping I could use it in a sermon illustration. When Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, let me tell you who it is that Jesus is inviting you and me to receive. And to get an idea, you have to look at the Hebrew word. Assuming Jesus was speaking Hebrew to these people. When he said, receive the Holy Spirit, it's pronounced like this. Receive the Ruach. Not Ruach. But Ruach, it's guttural, it's powerful. It sounds like some alien, sounds like a Klingon warrior of some kind using the Star Trek. Was that Star Trek or, or the other? I don't remember where it was from. But, but this is a powerful person. Nobody to be messed with. Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says in one of the other Gospels, it's good that I go to the Father so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. See, if Jesus had lived on forever, even to this day, he would only be one person. But what he wants to do is to infuse us, embed us with the Holy Spirit, with the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead so that we can then be the representatives of Christ going out into the world. Okay, so I really want you to catch the significance of this word, and so I'm going to ask you to repeat the word ruach. Repeat it with me now. Ruach. Good. Now, the word in the ancient Hebrew language has these letters, and these letters in the ancient Hebrew help define the meaning of the word. It starts off on the far right-hand side um, with, it's, the, it's pronounced with the letter R. And this is a person, it's a head on top of the trunk of a body, and it means person. The Holy Spirit is personable. The second letter is a nail, which binds two thoughts together. And the letter on the um, left-hand side, is the fence. You can see the upright poles, the string, the stay in between. And you put a bunch of these uh, uh, stays, uh, poles up, and you can build an enormous uh, fence to hold whatever size uh, uh, pen for animals that you have. And so the Holy Spirit is personable, and the Holy Spirit also protects you doesn't protect you from all the hazards of life. We go through those like everybody else. But the Lord protects your heart and protects you in such a fashion that when it comes your turn and my turn to die, that the Lord, uh, Holy Spirit protects us when we go to heaven. That the presence of, of God is inside of our life. This morning when I was in the hospital reading this passage to Jesus, and uh, explaining some of that. I wish you could have seen Judy's face. She, she is so sweet. Uh, she had me pause, and she said, she said, Holy Spirit, I receive you again. And, you know, in, in the simplicity of what she prayed, she caught what it means to receive. It's nothing that you can do to earn. It's not a construct of theology that you can believe. It is receiving, opening yourself up. And here's the issue. Opening yourself up to the control, the promptings, the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine. Now, among the world religions, Nobody, 
makes this kind of promise that, and I hesitate to use this expression, but it does communicate that a, a piece of divinity is given to you and me as a gift, and we receive it. None of the other world religions offer that. The other world religions offer a, um, a code of conduct, a way of coping and living in life. Nobody out there among the, in the catalog of gods, as you read the profile and the benefits of such a, uh, of, of Christianity, we are unique. Jesus is unique in giving us the Holy Spirit to help be with us, to be present with us. Lord, I'm asking that you would uh, help us, that you would uh, give us this good news, that we would believe it and receive it, that Jesus does give us peace. You know, in this world, we, we have tensions, we have anxieties, we have chaos out there, and Jesus is offering us peace, the peace that is not reasonable, the peace that says, while the world is falling apart around me, my world is not because I am connected with God. And we have that kind of peace and assurance. He also gives us a purpose and a mission. Uh, people quite often ask me as a pastor, they say, I don't know what the Lord wants me to do. Well, here's what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to go out and tell your friends what you have experienced with Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, Jesus wants you and me to receive the Holy Spirit so that we can be connected and feel the presence and the power of God flowing through our lives. Greg, would you, would you help us as we prepare ourselves for communion? Would you, um, would you give us a few moments to uh, think about the lesson, the good news that we have this morning. In the chronology of the Easter story, it was just two days before. Remember, this is Resurrection Day still. It was just two days before that Jesus was having a, a last supper, final meal with his disciples. And he invited He invited the uh, disciples into a new symbolism. He took the bread, which was common at the time. It was there at the dinner table. And he redefined what, what um, this was going to mean. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. He took the cup and he poured the cup and he said, this is my blood. And in the book of Corinthians, it adds on that this is for the remissions of sin. And that um, when you and I eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Receive now the body of Christ.
Jesus took the most common of elements and he set them aside for a most uncommon purpose and that is to remind us that on this occasion that we remember not recall but that we reattach ourselves to Christ and that is what you and I have done here today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have fed us at your table with spiritual food. Now, Lord, give us uh, grace. Give us grace to follow you, even as you send us. Give us grace to receive the Holy Spirit. Give us grace to have peace in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Before I give the uh, benediction, I want to just share with you just a brief announcement that we're going to have a congregational meeting where the uh, nominating committee is going to recommend uh, names for elders, deacons, and uh, somebody else. Support and endowments, thank you. Uh, In two weeks, on a Saturday at 1 o'clock, and we would invite you to uh, join us in the parking lot. Folks, not only is Jesus the most influential figure in history, but his bride is the church and this body which you and I belong to are the agent the agents the change agent that is going to infect and bless the rest of the world that the church is the last great hope of the world would you receive with me now or say with me these first five words of the benediction Uh, say with me God is able and willing I'll say the rest. God is able and willing to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power, the power of the cross, the power of the cross that is at work in us. To him be honor and glory in the church and in his son, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. One last thing, and that is that the hand of God is on you. Hey, I love you folks. Uh, Next week, we're going to look at Thomas, supposedly doubting Thomas. I hope you'll join us. Uh, Greg, would you lead us out now with some, with some, uh, a tune that will help us to meditate on what uh, we have learned today.